wind is intermittent, yeah. solar is intermittent. So when they're going, they're great, but you need something you can bring up quickly to fill in that gap. Very so that quickly, very because, quickly. Because you know, we're hearing stories, particularly in these markets like Texas, where wind is a big part that, I mean, sometimes the wind will go from several thousand megawatts to zero yeah. in less than a minute. Okay. And gas plants can come on within the minute, but, they, but there are many types of gas plants that can come on within 10 minutes. So the key is to encourage people to build natural gas plants that work in concert with wind and solar, okay. and natural gas can fill in that, that gap. So natural gas can support a growing amount of renewables. And a technique called hydrofracking has unlocked a huge unconventional supply in places like the Barnett Shale a field that can power 18 million people per year. These are gases that do not flow easily out of the rocks and sometimes have to be induced to come out, for example, by fracturing the rock through this hydrofracturing process and long horizontal drilling. Hydraulic fracturing is a way of first drilling a well and then pumping down fluids, uh, water, other chemicals, uh, and inducing the rock to break. And when the rock breaks, it opens up new surface area mm -hmm. uh, from which the gas can flow out. Now in the United States, I think there's about 2,000 trillion cubic feet of gas. 2,000 trillion. Yes, which would be two quadrillion cubic feet of gas, which is enormous. Or said another way, it's about 100 years of supply at present. Uh, consumption standards and to imagine that you never have to do make any other discoveries and you've got a hundred years of any resource is just extraordinary. It's inexpensive. There's so much of it that the cost is not expected to go up in the next few decades. Right. The problem with it is it's a fossil fuel and so it does produce carbon dioxide but only half as much as coal. But there's a controversy surrounding fracturing that centers on water. Now, how much water are you putting in to a typical uh, job? Like? You know, an average might be about three million gallons. Three million gallons mm -hmm. for the whole job. For the for for the uh, yeah the whole job for the whole well. Gotcha. And how many wells are out here on now, this pad? On, on this pad, we have five wells. Okay. So you do each one of those with three million gallons. It's a lot of water. It's a lot of water. You know, you, you pick up the paper today, you look on the news, and there's people talking about uh, fracturing. They're looking at it in Washington. Mm -hmm. You put other chemicals and kinds of things in it. There's um, some additives uh, pumping the, the water down itself. There's, there's quite a bit of friction, so we add a little bit of gel to it to, to slick it up. Okay. It makes it smoother. Okay. Uh, we put in some corrosion inhibitor, you know, chemicals like that that, yeah. uh, that help us. But over 99.5% of the fluid that right. goes in is, is just water right. and sand. That does mean that there are 15,000 gallons of additives going into each of these wells. And what people are worried about is, will fracturing contaminate our water supply? I went to see the agency that regulates fracking in Texas. We have overseen the process of hydraulic fracturing for decades now. And we're not aware of one documented case of groundwater contamination, for example, which is the big uh, concern that is voiced federally uh, and in, in Congress. In all the fracturing that's been done in the Texas so far? Those wells up in the Barnett, you drill down about 75, 8,000 feet. So there are over a mile and a half of shales and sandstones that protect the groundwater, the near surface groundwater from contamination. There have been a number of confirmed instances, as well as some uh, number of alleged but unconfirmed instances, right. uh, where natural gas uh, drilling uh, has um, negatively impacted groundwater supplies. But to the best of my knowledge, none of those confirmed examples uh, were related to a hydraulic fracturing operation. And in fact, most of the risks occur at the surface rather than downhole. Right. So the hydrofracking down here, if I understand you right, you don't know of any cases where the actual hydrofrac process caused problems at the surface, but it's things related to the hydrofracking that are done at the surface that could cause issues if they're not done properly. Uh, we can have fluids that are spilled at the surface. Mm -hmm. uh, waste can be spilled as they leave a lease. Mm -hmm. uh, pits for the temporary storage of fluids and waste can leak. 
hydraulic fracturing potentially is a problem, but in my mind, it's one of the least risky aspects of a natural gas operation. Right. The Congress is moving towards uh, requiring more supervision uh, over these fracturing uh, processes. Um, uh, it is certainly, I would say, not clear to me today uh, that there have been major consequences. But I think this is an area where what we need is good, objective measurements, analysis, and then whatever measures are required for environmental protection will be taken. There are uh, certainly many other deposits of shale gas and tight gas uh, that other countries can uh, access. Look, natural gas is much cleaner than coal, and I think this technology uh, is becoming a real game changer And as we think about a low carbon energy future. It seems the risk is not so much with fracking, but with handling the wastewater. Hopefully, gas producers and regulators can resolve these issues so we can have access to this abundant resource. In other parts of the world, conventional natural gas supplies are growing too. How far off uh, the shore are we? Well, uh, you see that platform up there? Way up there in the distance on the horizon? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's an Iranian platform. We're right on the border here. In, uh, this is where all the ships line up to get out the straits. Gas, uh, there's a tremendous amount of gas. Uh, the problem is that because it's a gas, uh, if it's not close to the people who want to use it, it tends to be expensive to move it. The gas is uh, piped into uh, Ross Lafon, processed and made into LNG, and then uh, shipped all over the world. In LNG, we, we turn the natural gas, we freeze it basically, so that it turns into a liquid. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we can put it in a ship uh, and move it across the ocean. Qatar was sitting on this uh, resource, which is the, uh, the North Field for many years, was discovered in 1976. So there was a vision in Qatar, why couldn't we make this natural gas economical? Mm -hmm. I mean, Qatar in the last 10 years has, you know, grown from zero production to about 30% of the world market. And the only way we can make it economical is that we build very large scale plants. This one plant is so large, it could power 18.5 million people per year. On the shipping side, right now we're building what we call the Q-Max ships, and the Q-Max is 250,000 meters. 250,000 cubic meters yes, on one ship? On one ship. So, so this, is, this is gigantic. Uh, gigantic. So, the ship is being loaded now, and then you have water falling down the side of the ship. Yeah. We call the water curtain. This protects the ship's hull from any spills, because as you know, this, uh, this liquid is minus 163 degrees Celsius, uh, and if it touches the hull directly, it will make the hull crack. How do you keep the LNG cool once it's loaded? They have a very huge insulation boxes, which can keep the temperature inside the tank steady, so this is a giant thermos. Yes, as a, yes. a giant it is a cooler. Giant cooler. <laughs> it yes. never loses yes. heat. Yes. Unbelievable. So we consider this as a pipeline in the sea. I mean, these ships. Exactly. Uh, they are as, as exactly. good as a pipeline. In fact, they are more reliable. Mm -hmm. They don't have to go through the geopolitics, where you're crossing countries and yes. the problems, some of the issues which we have seen, you know, last years. I mean, it's very secure supply. Yeah. We may even eventually see essentially a world market in natural gas mm -hmm. develop as it has for oil. And that would give a lot more diversity of supply. Low carbon, low price, and the ability to back up wind and solar mean that natural gas will likely be a vital part of our energy transition. <laughs>